Good morning. Uh, it's, uh, I believe, 8 o'clock, so we'd better uh, start our program for today. Uh, let me just uh, uh, do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, on the tables, uh, there are some, uh, there is some equipment for translations. The uh, conference this morning by uh, the secretary will be in Spanish, uh, but translation uh, will be provided for those of you who are not bilingual or speak only uh, English. Uh, uh, and um, you can uh, make use of that. At the end of the uh, first panel, we'll pick up the equipment. Uh, the two panels this morning that follow the secretary's lecture uh, will be in uh, English. So if you need the equipment, please make use of it. Uh, my name is uh, Tony Payan. I am the director of the Mexico Center at Rice University's Baker Institute. Since the 1980s, Mexico outlined a new route in its economic development plans. Its accession to the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade in 1986 and the North American Free Trade Agreement in 1994 were two important steps in implementing that strategy. The country's economic opening came accompanied by an important political transition as well. A divided Congress in 1997 and the election of the first opposition party in the year 2000. Among all these changes, underlined by a remarkable national consensus on Mexico's future, the energy sector had lagged behind and remained closed until 2013 and 2014, when the Mexican government, faced with declining production, loss of oil revenue, and technological limitations, decided to start a major structural reform in the sector. The challenges, as we all know, have not been small. There is growing political criticism, rising uncertainty in the global energy markets, unfinished regulatory puzzles, and potential social and environmental challenges as the reform moved onto its implementation stages. The path is indeed fraught with challenges, but also laced with opportunities. The purpose of this event today is to explore some of those opportunities in oil, in gas, and electricity. I hope that we all draw great benefit from our discussions today and continue to learn on how best to push this reform to success, because it is good for Mexico, it is good for the United States, it is good for Texas, and it is good for Houston, and in general, it is good for North America. But before I invite Mr. George Gonzalez to introduce our keynote speaker, His Excellency Pedro Joaquin Colwell, Mexico's Secretary of Energy, let me take a moment to dedicate this event to one of the great minds of Mexico's energy reform, Edgar Rangel Germán, who worked tirelessly for this historic opening in Mexico. We'll hear more about his role in bringing about this important reform later in the day. George, thank you. My name is George Gonzalez, and I'm a corporate and energy partner at, with the law firm Haynes & Moon. First, I'd like to extend Tony's warm welcome on behalf of Haynes & Moon co-sponsoring the Americas Colloquium, Me Mexico Energy Reform Opportunities in All Directions. I would, all, I would like on behalf of the firm to thank each of the participants for coming to the Baker Institute today to provide their meaningful views of the energy reform and participate in this unique forum. It is appropriate that we are holding this colloquium at a university a university where people come to openly learn and exchange their views. And the law firm is pleased to develop our relationship with Rice University, with the Baker Institute, with the important Mexico Center. A few years ago, the New York Times described Mexico as a new land of opportunity, a place where there is energy here, the feeling that anything can happen. The article highlighted that the stars are aligning for the country. And the opportunities for Mexico are significant. Mexico remains one of the most significant sources of foreign oil for the United States after Canada and Saudi Arabia. The US Energy Information Administration calculates that Mexico's gas deposits 
are the fourth largest in the world, with the potential to ensure decades of low-cost energy, and the U.S. is Mexico's primary energy trade partner. One of the goals of this America's Colloquium is to provide a forum for the discussion of how the stars may align, what the broader energy universe might look like from opportunities in power to natural gas midstream to exploration and production, and how Houston, Texas, and U.S. enterprises can take an active role alongside Mexican enterprises and institutions in participating in that broader alignment. So yes, there is energy here. There is an ongoing once in three generations reform in Mexico. We are here to discuss that reform and what it may mean for a North American renaissance, Canada, the US, and Mexico, including other industries that are direct beneficiaries of a sustained economic energy supply from manufacturing to trade, and what that may mean for the quality of the daily life in our hemisphere. We will hear from multiple voices and perspectives on the potential change, important voices from government, from academia, from industry, and from service providers. From the opportunities in Mexico's power market to opportunities in Mexico's natural gas and midstream sector to a, tr to a trending discussion of the ongoing opportunities in the exploration and production bid rounds. This America's Colloquium will address these topics, these planets, that together with the stars that are aligning form the energy universe for Mexico, the United States, the Western Hemisphere, and the world. Indeed, there is energy here. There is an ongoing reform in Mexico. We will discuss this constellation today at this America's Colloquium. Welcome. Um, before I introduce our keynote speaker, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, we have t uh, cards on each table for specific questions. Uh, so if you have a question for him once he's done with his presentation, please fill, write it on the card and we'll have people from the, the Baker Institute pick, the, pick up your questions. It is indeed uh, my great pleasure to introduce His Excellency Pedro Joaquin Coldwell he is Mexico's Secretary of Energy, appointed in 2012. He also serves as President of the Administrative Council of Pemex, the Federal Electricity Commission, and of the National Center for Energy Control and the National Center for Control of Natural Gas. As Secretary of Energy, he chaired the International Renewable Energy Agency's Assembly in 2014, as well as the Energy and Climate Partnership of the Americas and the Clean Energy Ministerial, both in 2015. Among his career in public office, he was elected a federal congressman in 1979 for the state of Quintana Roo and state governor from 1981 to 1987. He served within the federal government as Secretary of Tourism from 1990 to 1993 and as ambassador to Cuba from 1998 to 2000. He served as a senator from 2006 to 2012 and was chair of the Constitutional Amendments Committee during his term Within the Institutional Revolutionary Party, or PRI, he was Secretary General, Chairman of the National Commission on Inter Internal Processes, as well as Party Chairman from 2012 to 2013 during the presidential elections of that year. In September 12th, he was recognized, in September 12th, he was recognized as the Energy Minister of the Year by the prestigious international magazine Petroleum Economist. He holds a bachelor's degree in law from the Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City. Please, without further ado, help, help me welcome Secretary General Pedro Joaquin Colwell. Antes de iniciar la presentación, eh, 
de los avances sobre la implementación de la reforma energética mexicana. Eh, quiero unirme a las palabras de Tony Payán y recordar la memoria de un eh, extraordinario mexicano, el ingeniero Edgar Rangel, a quien lamentablemente perdimos recientemente que tenía muchas ilusiones de venir a trabajar como investigador a la Universidad Rice. Edgar fue decisivo, hizo una aportación notable al fortalecimiento del órgano regulador de la explotación y extracción de hidrocarburos en México. Eh, era uno de sus pilares un comisionado estratégico y fue también quien diseñó dos de las licitaciones más exitosas que hemos llevado a cabo, la 1.2 y la 1.3. Lo extrañamos mucho y es eh, bueno recordarlo hoy. Me siento muy honrado por la invitación del Mexico Center at Rice University Baker Institute para compartir con ustedes los avances de la reforma energética mexicana. Quiero agradecer al embajador Edward Jerejan, director del Baker Institute, y a Tony Payam, director del Centro México, por convocar a líderes académicos y expertos, empresarios y estudiantes del sector energético, a fin de que conozcan los grandes cambios que se están dando en México y las oportunidades de inversión. En los primeros meses de su administración, el presidente de México, Peña Nieto, reconoció la necesidad de impulsar una reforma energética profunda e integral. Antes de la reforma, nuestro país tenía un marco regulatorio sumamente rígido que concentraba la inversión en las manos exclusivas del Estado a través de dos compañías que eran monopolios públicos, Pemex y la CFE, las compañías de petróleo y electricidad. El modelo regulatorio anterior que el país tenía prohibía la inversión privada en prácticamente toda la cadena de valor, producción, transporte, almacenamiento, comercialización y transformación industrial de hidrocarburos, así como en la transmisión, distribución y comercialización de electricidad. Este modelo que por décadas funcionó para el país comenzó a generar rendimientos decrecientes y planteó un sentido de urgencia para el gobierno de emprender cambios profundos, pues dos grandes valores de la nación estaban en riesgo. Por un lado, la seguridad en el suministro de petróleo y gas, por la otra, la competitividad económica el riesgo de perder empresas y, por ende, la pérdida de empleos. En las siguientes diapositivas explicaré por qué estos valores se encontraban en juego. Como pueden ver, esta gráfica muestra el comportamiento de la producción de crudo antes de la reforma, así como el precio del barril y los montos de inversión del sector desde 1997 al año 2012. En 2004, México alcanzó una producción máxima de 3.338 millones de barriles de petróleo crudo equivalente. Este récord histórico se debió al aprovechamiento de grandes yacimientos petroleros como Cantarel, conocido para ustedes, que se encuentra en aguas someras del Golfo de México. 
A partir de ese año, la producción de crudo empezó a caer de forma gradual y constante, lo que nos llevó en 2012 a un nivel de 2.5 millones de barriles de petróleo crudo equivalente. Este año... This year. We estimate that we are going to have between 300,000 and 350,000 uh, less barrels. Initially, this decrease did not affect the public finances because it coincided with the increase in oil prices in the international markets. Which means, even if we produce less, it was offset by the high price per barrel. As you can see, in 2012, for instance, the Mexican mix was almost $102 per barrel, which is uh, an unprecedented price. The decline of the gigantic Cantarell field told us that we were nearing a, a change of era in the hydrocarbon sector, and if we did not do something about the energy reform, we would have a collapse in the oil and gas industry. The easy oil era had finished for Mexico. The potential for uh, exploiting these hydrocarbon fields is huge. 76% of our resources, prospective resources, are located in deep water and ultra deep waters in the uh, Gulf of Mexico and in unconventional reservoirs. Furthermore, we are looking to use more sophisticated methods for uh, the extraction of hydrocarbons, such as advanced uh, and improved recovery, so that we can reach those places where the remaining oil is located in our mature fields, where there are three times the entire prospective resources and where approximately 22 percent are considered uh, reserves. To face this new era, we really have to have uh, uh, the latest technology and we have to have the financial resources that we do not have in the country. On the other hand, the, the old power system in Mexico was concentrated in the state company, which caused very high uh, power costs that were making the system uh, and the economy less competitive compared to the economy of our main commercial partner. In 2012, the average rates of the Mexican power company were 25% higher compared to the average in the U.S., considering that the electrical subsidies would reach up to 0.75% of the uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, without these subsidies, our rates were 73% more expensive. The consumers that did not have the subsidies were paying costs that were even higher, 135% for commercial use and 84% higher for industrial use. The elections in 2012, when the government of Mr. Peña Nieto was about to begin, we, we had a choice at the time. We could continue with the prior model, and we could leave the country to even higher debt, which is what happened during the bitter experiences that we had in the 80s, uh, making the countries, uh, our country, absorb all the geological and financial risks of undertaking this exploration and exploitation activity ourselves, or do what other oil companies had done, which was leave behind this uh, monopoly model where the state did everything and open up for investment opportunities to the private sector, changing the role the government and the state plays. From a business state, we become a state that sets the policy and regulates the business activity throughout the value change in the energy sector. Given that reason, the president decided to break with the past and to start with something that, according to the international experts, is not just a reform, is also a revolution 
in the energy sector because it means a change of paradigm. Uh, paradigm, as we will see in a minute. This is a very profound, deep reform, comprehensive reform that had never seen, been seen in Mexico before. A few times in our past, in our history, we tried to reform the different sectors separately, the power on the one hand and hydrocarbons on the other. But the reform implemented by Mr. Peña Nieto uh, includes both. It's totally comprehensive. This new model means opening up the markets throughout the entire value chain. The objectives in hydrocarbons are to attract investment and technology so that we can access our non-conventional resources in deep water and ultra deep water and also the remaining oil in mature fields to incorporate our oil reserves and to promote the creation of a private industrial system very diversified that will coexist and complement our great national company, Pemex. Regarding the power sector, there was the creation of the wholesale power market that allows for the participation of public and private companies in equal conditions, with the goal of promoting competition and offering power at more competitive prices. Likewise, uh, mechanisms were created such as the uh, certificates of clean energy so that we would promote power generation from clean sources. This reform meant changes to three articles of the Mexican Constitution, including modification of laws and the publication of new laws. We have 21 new secondary laws. The executive power had to issue 25 new regulations and numerous administrative actions by the regulatory agencies with the purpose of regulating and creating these markets. The reform also created a new institutional uh, structure with the creation of three agencies and a new financial tool. Uh, likewise, it also strengthened the regulatory uh, agencies, the National Commission on Hydrocarbons and the uh, Energy Regulation Commission, and it transformed the legal structure of Pemex and the power. Uh, Federal Commission. These new institutions are the Agency for Industrial Security and Environmental Protection. We call it ASEA, that is already regulating industrial safety of all oil facilities and is already issuing all the regulations for the protection of the environment and for industrial safety. Those are the ones that have to be followed both by Pemex and the private companies that are investing in our country. Two other public entities were also created, decentralized. One is the National Center of Energy Control, CENACE. It operates the national power system. And CENAGAS, which is the one that manages the uh, gas pipelines in the country. This way, the, the, the Mexican state companies, the power company and the oil company will compete with the private companies, and Senace and Senegas will make sure that there is a level playing field for all companies. The Mexican energy model can only work with strong regulatory agencies, and this is what's happened with the National Commission on Hydrocarbons and the uh, Energy Regulatory Commission. They were both given more resources, both economic resources, and they were giving teeth so that they could do their regulatory work. The National Commission on Hydrocarbons regulates the exploration and extraction of hydrocarbons, and the uh, National Energy Commission is the one that regulates everything that has to do with gas, power, and first-hand sales of oil 
and uh, oil Pemex products. Y la Pemex de and the Federal Commission on Electricity were transformed from state productive companies and the energy reform makes them be efficient and they are also regulated because in the past they had been self-regulated. The management councils of these companies, the administration was restructured. We now have independent uh, advisors according to the best uh, cooperative practices. The implementation of an energy reform so broad and so deep as the Mexican reform has been requires a long process. However, during the administration of President Peña Nieto. We want to advance as much as we can so that the citizens can actually see the changes. The first step to the implementation of this reform was to implement the Ronda Cero, Round Zero. Through this process, the state guaranteed to Pemex in those fields in which it had the financial and technical capability for their development. Uh, in the older model, Pemex had to do it all, and it had to do it alone. It was pretty much the only oil company in the world that could not partner with any other companies. This model has already changed. Round Zero assigned to Pemex 83% of the reserves to P in the country and 21% of the prospective resources. The state reserved for itself 17% of the reserves to P and 69% of the prospective resources, areas in which we are already uh, opening up so that the private companies can participate. With these fields and in the areas in which the state will be developing uh, their activities through Pemex, we could produce 2.5 million uh, barrels per day for the next 20 years. Furthermore, our state company will have to find partners so that these areas can provide capital and technology uh, through farm apps. The second step was round one, Ronda Uno. This included four tenders, out of which we have concluded the first three. And despite the actual uh, or current prices of crude in the world, the results were actually a success. These tenders were done under the most strict transparency standards and through uh, our regulatory organism, which is the National Commission of Hydrocarbons. And uh, the adjudication was uh, broadcast in real time through the internet. This was followed for approximately 100,000 people. To date, we have already signed 30 contracts for the exploration and exploitation of hydrocarbons in uh, both uh, land and uh, shallow waters. Mexico is diversified, and it is diversifying its industrial system of hydrocarbons. Uh, additionally to Pemex, we have 37 companies from seven countries that are already participating in the development of projects. Estos These contracts will bring to Mexico an investment of $7 billion and they will generate tens of thousands of jobs. The fourth tender for round one is already in process. It is known by the media as the crown of the jewel, the jewel of the crown. It is the most complex that we have done to date, and that is the reason why uh, we have it in the fourth place, so that we could learn uh, and gain experience from the first three rounds. It includes 10 contractual areas in the uh, lost uh, belt and in the, uh, in the saltwater um, basin in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. These are 10 contractual areas in a surface of 24,000 uh, square kilometers that will be uh, done by a license. 26 companies registered for this uh, tender, and six of them are from the U.S.
adjudication will take place in a very transparent manner and it will take place uh, on the next uh, month of December, December the 5th. The energy reform opened up an opportunity for Pemex to partner and to work jointly with the big oil companies in the world to explore and exploit oil in our deep waters. In the past, Pemex was not allowed to partner. It was illegal. Now, Pemex can find partners that will allow it to increase its platform for production, uh, to get capital and technology, and to share geological and financial risks presented by the oil business. In order to participate in this first farm out uh, from Penex in the field uh, by the name Trion, we had 10 companies uh, registered. Three of these 10 companies came from the US. It has a surface of uh, uh, two, uh, uh, 1,285 square kilometers and uh, more than 2,500 meters in depth. It's different from other oil fields. It doesn't only have prospective resources. It also has total reserves, 3P, uh, that amount to 485 million barrels of oil uh, equivalent. You need investments in the amount of $11 billion for its exploration and exploitation. For Pemex, this first farm out is really a historical event. Thanks to the energy reform, now it can align its operation to the best international practices and have access to the latest technology and financial resources. Recently, we announced the first tender for round two for the adjudication of 15 contractual areas for both exploration and exploitation and extraction in shallow waters in the Gulf of Mexico with uh, prospective resources, uh, 1,587 million um, uh, barrel uh, and equivalent, and it has a remaining volume of 869 uh, million barrels. We also expect that the first barrels in this uh, uh, field will begin, produ will begin production in 2020. Uh, the areas have been almost in their entirety nominated by the industry, which means there is a very explicit interest from one or several companies to um, uh, to bid for each one of these contracts. The second tender for round two was announced just uh, in the last month. Round 2.2 .2 is, is the second time in which uh, land areas uh, being tendered and include 12 contractual areas for exploration and uh, extraction of hydrocarbons. Nine contractual areas are located in the Burgos Basin and the other three in the Southeast Basin. These are areas with potential, uh, proven potential, that are located in areas near facilities uh, from Pemex. Ten of them already have their own infrastructure. Given this reason, the companies that obtain these contracts will be able to start working uh, without delay. Each one of these uh, bids for these oil rounds are designed so that they can meet the objectives of the energy policy of the country. In the specific case of this round 2.2, the goal is to extract dry gas and wet gas, which are valuable supplies for the petrochemical industry. The reform has also had immediate results and very tangible benefits. One of them, very important, 
es que estamos incrementando is that nuestro we are increasing our uh, geological um, knowledge nationally, the knowledge of what we have in the Gulf of Mexico. The National de Commission de of Hydrocarbons has authorized 36 permits to 15 different companies that are investing over $2 billion dollars in the country. They are uh, uh, undertaking a 3D seismic and they're doing non-invasive work in pretty much all of the Mexican areas in the Gulf. These 34 uh, permissions are the equivalent of 3.2 times all the seismic work that had been performed in Mexico throughout the entire history. Another benefit that the energy reform has brought in the short term is the expansion of the national network of gas pipelines. The energy reform uh, wants to promote natural gas because it generates power, uh, very competitive prices, is friendlier to the environment, and it promotes industrial development. The totality of the national network of uh, gas pipelines that we had in Mexico was almost 11,000 kilometers. Under the government of President Peña Nieto, 10,000 additional kilometers are being built. Uh, four years after the beginning of the expansion, we have advanced 78% of the kilometers of gas lines that were planned for 2019. This is an investment of almost $10 billion. The infrastructure will remain underneath the ground. It won't be seen, but you will be able to see its benefits in the development of the country. The expansion of the pipeline network will come hand in hand uh, with another strategy, the reconfiguration of the old diesel plants and uh, fuel plants with the goal that they can start operating with natural gas so that we can decrease power rates and the emission of, uh, of pollution or uh, gases into the environment. And other measure that we're promoting as part of the reform is the expansion of the transportation and storing network for uh, oil products. In the past, only Pemex was able to develop and build this infrastructure, and it was the only company that could import uh, fuel and sell. This made our storage capacity uh, very, very low. Average 72 hours, and in the Valley of Mexico, it was 24 hours. The opening up of the permits for importation of oil products and the opening up of the market uh, for public sale of gasoline sends a very clear message to the private sector for them to invest in pipelines for the transportation of liquid fuel and terminals for storing, and it will increase competition between the different service stations for the benefit of the consumers. This way, we will see a rise of a new private system for transportation and storage of oil products that will coexist with the PEMEX system, increasing both uh, the security and the energy security in the country. Several companies have shown their interest in building this new infrastructure for the transportation and storage of oil products in the country. The first uh, gas line with private capital has uh, already had their open, uh, their open season, and it will take gas from Corpus Christi to Santa Catarina in the state of Nuevo León in Mexico. Other companies are also interested in transportation of gasoline from the harbors of the Gulf of Mexico to the center of the country, starting with the construction of new pipelines for their uh, transportation. Other companies are considering importing uh, gasoline or fuel by train. 
As I mentioned before, in electricity, in electricity, we also went from having just one power company, one national power company that was in charge of generation, transmission, distribution, marketing. We went to a model in which we have multiple participants in the power market, managed by Senase as an independent operator. The short-term market started operations at the beginning of 2016, and it is right now in the process of growth and maturation. Right now, we have three private companies uh, that are doing generation, and we have 200 companies with permits uh, that are represented by the national uh, power company. Furthermore, 10 more companies are in the process of incorporating to the system. In the long-term market, we are going to have energy sales, uh, power, and certificates of clean energy. With these uh, certificates, it was established that by 2018, at least 5% of power consumption of the big users should come from uh, friendlier energies, cleaner energies for the environment. By 2019, this percentage has to increase to 5.8%. With the new power model, we have an environment that is competitive for business, transparent and with very clear rules. We are eliminating barriers for the generators and qualified consumers, and the consumers have more options to purchase electricity. In the past month of March, we finished the first auction of clean energy in which we obtained one of the most competitive prices for renewables in the world, especially in uh, the area of solar energy that was placed among the three lowest that have been uh, achieved so far. As a result of this auction, 11 different companies from different countries, among them Mexico, will have built in the next three years 16 new uh, wind energy uh, centrals and solar centrals, um, energy centrals that will bring to the country investments for, uh, uh, for $600 million. These new solar projects will provide three-fourths uh, of the capacity that had been installed in Mexico in the last two decades. The second energy auction, clean energy auction, took place uh, today, and we, he, we can show you here the preliminary results. On uh, September the 28th, we will announce the official results. The good results of the first auction attracted the attention of investors. We received 38% more proposals than in the first one. Likewise, we are trying to expand our electric transmission power lines. In the near future, we will announce a call uh, for the first transmission line uh, that will include private investment with a length of 600 kilometers circuit, and it, re it will represent investments in the amount of uh, $12 billion. Companies from countries such as Germany, China, Colombia, Mexico, and Switzerland have expressed their interest in participating in the development of this project that will transport mainly clean energy, such as wind energy, solar, and hydraulic energy generated in the south of our country. They will transport to the central regions of the country, which is one of the areas of biggest demand. With the arrival of these new private companies in Mexico, 
We estimate that our country will require 135,000 135, uh, new experts in the energy sector. That's why we have a new program, 60,000 new scholarships for young people. We also have signed several agreements with different universities and academic institutions from Mexico, the US, and Canada to promote uh, research and training of resources uh, that are specialized human resources. In in COP21 in Paris, Mexico subscribed uh, to the joint declaration, Mission Innovation, in which 20 member countries and a group of 28 big investors added their support to promote investment in clean technology. Our country committed to increase, double, the public investment and private investment in research and development. For this purpose, we created five new Mexican centers for innovation and in energy. These are consortiums between universities, research centers, and uh, different companies to promote research and technology development in solar energy, geothermic energy, wind energy, bioenergy, and ocean. The call is open for uh, SEMIAS in uh, smart power networks and for the capture, use, and storage of uh, carbon dioxide. In this slide, you can see the investments brought by the energy reform with the three uh, hydrocarbon bids that have been undertaken so far. You see the expansion of the gas lines that is already in process and the first uh, clean energy auction. As you can appreciate, we are advancing in the diversification of our energy sector and we are attracting investment to modernize our infra infrastructure and to improve our energy security. Nowadays, investment uh, commitments derived from this reform are already over $22 billion. And if we add to this the results of the second clean energy uh, auction, the one that took place yesterday, that will bring additional investment, uh, an additional $4 billion. So we would have about $26 billion uh, in investment pretty much signed. Uh, we have the contracts and uh, that have been brought to us by the energy reform. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary uh, Joaquin, for sharing with us this very important uh, summary of the state of the Mexico energy reform. We do have a few questions for you. We are going to take them as a whole so that we can use our time uh, in the most efficient manner. The first one has to do with Pemex. These two questions I thought were very similar. They are key. The first question is why has it taken so long to migrate the service contracts from Pemex? And the second question is, can you explain to us or can you comment on the support uh, that the government offers Pemex because it does appear that Pemex will require an enormous amount of support, at least in the next two or three years, given the price of oil? When we were talking to the legislators about energy reform, it was proposed that the contracts known as CIEPs that had been created by the energy reform uh, 2018 they should be given the right 
to migrate to production sharing contracts or license as uh, established by the new uh, energy reform without the need to go to a new tender or uh, another process. It was about recognizing what I think uh, is already established in the U.S. is what you know is the, the it's a grandfather bill. That's how you know it here. So you had an original call. And I thought at the time that that would be for the first production sharing contracts or licenses uh, born out of the reform during the implementation phase. Because I thought the future uh, tenders were going to take longer. But the results have been the other way around. Uh, we have finished three rounds, and we have three more in process, and certainly we have not been able to migrate uh, you know, those contracts from the ACFs to the COPs yet. It has been easier to open up the rounds for the new contracts than transforming the existing contracts. And the reasons are many. Uh, and first of all, because Pemex and its counterpart on the contract, the other company, first of all, they have to agree. They have to liquidate or finish the prior contract. And many times there have been big differences in order to be able to close this gap. They have not agreed. Uh, they haven't agreed on the numbers. They haven't agreed on the expenses. Uh, they haven't agreed on the amount on, of the investments. On the other hand, they have not been able to show the Secretary of Energy or Treasury that this migration will provide better economic interest. In many cases, because the fields where these contracts are, they, they don't have, uh, they're not lucrative enough. They're not, uh, they don't provide enough revenue. Also, there was a delay in, in terms of the fiscal terms that would apply to this migration. Another thing that also delayed this was the evaluation, the appraisal of the assets in these fields. We have formed a new group, a new working group. Uh, the, it was um, between Treasury, Energy, and Pemex, and we are working, we are working very fast, and we really hope that in the next few months we're going to be able to finally crystallize these migrations. But I do acknowledge that uh, one of the few aspects of the energy reform that have been delayed has been this one. The other question is a very interesting question. The, uh, one of Pemex finances. Pemex finances are really suffering. They have taken a huge blow uh, for different reasons. First of all, because of the accumulation of debt uh, throughout time. Uh, uh, and very recently, because of the dramatic fall uh, in international oil prices, that went down almost 80% um, or, or it made revenues at Pemex go down almost 80%. Pemex uh, versus other oil companies that perform activities that are upstream and downstream activities, and uh, in a way they're able to offset the decreasing revenues in the upstream sectors with, um, because of their revenues in uh, refining and transformation and downstream. Pemex doesn't receive any benefits from this uh, for different for reasons, we accumulate huge losses, which means we are being struck by two uh, different things, the, the, the dramatic fall in prices in upstream, and also the losses, huge losses. Uh, due to the operation or deficient operation of the refineries uh, in Pemex. The energy reform provides Pemex 
with the authority and the possibility of facing this crisis in a better way. A very important uh, way of doing this is the renegotiation. The reform gave Pemex the renegotiation power over its debt. Uh, Pemex had accumulated uh, work that labor that uh, because of the retirement uh, programs, uh, retirement for their workers. It was 1.1 billion um, pesos in debt for our U.S. friends here. Uh, I'm sorry, when I'm talking about Mexican billion, I'm not talking about 1,000 million. I'm talking about 1 million million. So it, that gives you a dimension of the debt that had been accumulated by Pemex. So this reform gave an incentive so that the, Pemex, the administration of Pemex can negotiate with the unions. They can renegotiate new labor conditions. And this incentive is that it means that for each peso that it manages, the company manages to reduce uh, from this debt, the government will provide another peso. Um, this negotiation already took place, and this will really favor um, Pemex finances in the future. The government already has done a first injection of funds uh, for the amount they are due, about 50,000 million pesos, 50 billion uh, pesos, and there will be another one coming up, and that will also provide a relief for Pemex. And on the other hand, this reform provides other possibilities to Pemex, such as um, arm, the farm out. Uh, that's what I was talking about in order to get new partners. And it also provides uh, opportunities to, uh, to incorporate those that are non-strategic assets so that you can monetize those assets and obtain capital that way so that they can they can survive this tempest that is really hitting its finances right now, uh, caused by lack of efficiency and market conditions. Two more questions here. The, with regards to the non-conventional reserves, gas and oil, esquisto. The, the, the round the bidding has been postponed uh, twice. There was a five-year plan that had been proposed. Uh, is this five-year plan still on or not? Or when will this process, when will this bidding round uh, start for non-conventionals? And the second question that goes along with it is separate, but but it's, uh, it's sort of, uh, I'm going to put them together. Uh, who are the owners of the seismic data in this open market reform? The round that was uh, being considered for non-conventional fields in our original plan was 1.5. We suspended it for two reasons. The first one being because the international prices uh, went down. And our impression was that there would be no interest from the industry because of this huge drop in prices, that they wouldn't be interested in non-conventional fields in Mexico, specifically in areas where there is no infrastructure. There is nothing built. Um, in recent times, uh, several companies have requested that we reopen 1.5. The other reason why we stopped this is that we did not have the environmental regulation in order to uh, to, to perform the non-conventionals. We expect that we will have this regulation 
a principios de enero Already del by próximo the año. beginning of January next year. De enero del año uh, January next year, we will be able to start consultations on uh, regulations, environmental regulations, no so uh, for non-conventionals. So maybe it will be January, social, February, so that we do the social consultation at the time and everything will be ready by March. So by the end of the first trimester next year, we will be ready to issue the, the bid for 1.5, which is perhaps it will become 2.4 now uh, for non-conventionals. But um, we don't want to do it if we don't have prior to that um, everything well established, social acceptance and the environmental regulations um, and the new uh, industrial safety agency is working really hard on these regulations. And if uh, I, I will let you know that it will be aligned with the best international practices. The seismic data, oh, the seismic data in the old model, only Pemex could um, perform this. Uh, this seismic testing, and Pemex was the owner of all this information, of all this data. The reform now establishes that this geological data belongs to the National Commission on Hydrocarbons. Uh, Pemex already gave their information to this commission, and the reform uh, establishes the possibility uh, that private companies, as you have seen today, private companies will be able to perform uh, 3D seismic with permission. And these private companies that perform the testing, they could be the owners of the information uh, by paying a commission to the National Commission and by providing the regulatory agencies a copy of the results. And the private companies can market their own information. They can commercialize this. This works for us. There has been a huge incentive for different companies to come perform 3D seismic in Mexico, as you saw on the slide that I showed you earlier today. Uh, nowadays, the area of uh, most activity in 3D seismic in the whole planet is the, the Gulf, in the Gulf of Mexico, in Mexico. This has to do with the political environment. Given the political environment in Mexico right now, for instance, um, the approval by President Peña Nieto and perhaps uh, the approval ratings for President Peña Nieto, um, perhaps uh, a resurgence of the anti-establishment candidates uh, such as López Obrador. How fragile or long-lasting do you think this reform is going to be? That is a very interesting question. First of all, uh, certainly, uh, as government and as many other many democratic governments nowadays, we're going through uh, a low approval uh, rating time. Uh, but I do want to point out that the institutions in the country are working. They're working correctly, and this um, is not affecting at all the governance of our country. The energy reform is being implemented in conditions of uh, it, in totally normal conditions. How long will the energy reform last? We believe the energy reform has been designed and is consolidated so that it is it, it, that it is a change that will last indefinitely in Mexico. It is in the constitutional text. Three articles of the constitution were changed, and there was also a constitutional decree issued uh, that has about 25 articles, if memory serves right, which shows uh, at the highest level all the different uh, principles of opening and uh, competition that are part of this reform. Even though we will have elections in Mexico, both legislative and for president in 2018, the Mexican constitution prohibits one party 
from reaching the majority to be able to reform the Constitution on its own. It's just not possible. To reform the Constitution in Mexico is a very rigid Constitution. It requires two-thirds of... Uh, of members of Congress in the Union to approve, and most of the uh, Congresses in the different states also. So, so you have this reform really anchored in our Constitution. The other guarantee that the reform will last, in my personal opinion, is reality. We abandoned the prior model of concentrating all activities, oil activities, and power activities in the hands of the state, because it was not practical. It was not doable anymore. And I do not see in this century, century 21st, I, I don't see any government, whichever party, uh, I, I don't see them doing anything as silly as wanting for the state to be the only one investor again, the only one acquiring debt, and the only one running all the risks on its own, uh, especially in the hydrocarbon business. I, I, I don't see the conditions, the economic conditions for that, to be able to implement this. It, it doesn't sound uh, like a common sense thing to do. I, I think that the reform is advancing, and I think that's another guarantee. Uh, if, provided the reform keeps moving forward in its implementation, and provided people can see the changes derived from this reform, many of those uh, changes are going to be seen now during the administration of President Peña Nieto. Many of the beneficial changes people are going to start seeing later, maybe during the first third of the next administration. We're running out of time, but I want uh, to pose three more questions to you before we conclude. The first one has to do with the new uh, electricity rates, um, when are they going to start going in effect, especially for industrial and commercial operations, that is in terms of electricity prices and in terms of gas, are you going to open up gas prices and you're going to delink them from the Henry Hub uh, index in the U.S.? And the last one is in the U.S. there is a mandate for the use of 10 percent of ethanol in gasoline. What are the plans for Mexico with regards to ethanol? So uh, electric rates, uh, Henry Hub, and ethanol. Oh, uh, electric rates for now uh, in Mexico are, are set by uh, the Secretary of uh, Treasury in Mexico following a formula that says 80 percent uh, is the cost of uh, fuel, uh, whatever generates. It could be carbon, natural gas, or whatever it is. These uh, prices are updated every two months or so. Uh, based on this formula, and there, uh, this is automatic, and it depends on the variation of the costs of, um, the, of, of the supply itself. That's what's going to cost for the prices to go up or down. Uh, what I do want to point out is that thanks to the fact that we have transformed Several uh, several plans from uh, from combustolio to gas prices have already changed and the distance or the the separation between the rates in the U.S. versus the prices and rates in Mexico has really um, been eliminated. We have lower rates now. We have comparable rates, maybe not comparable to Texas, but comparable to California or other states. We do have lower rates uh, for electricity in Mexico right now. Ethanol, 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 uh, use of ethanol, percentage of ethanol in uh, fuel, in gas. The percentage of ethanol in gas cannot be over 5.8 percent. That was what was established by the Energy Regulation Commission, because according to the experts, if it goes above that, ethanol can generate um, 
uh, ozone and uh, promote the environmental degradation. So that is the rule, up to 5.8 as a component of uh, gasoline and uh, opening up the gas prices uh, so uh, and linking it to the Henry Hub uh, index. We have issued a plan, uh, which is the is a roadmap to get to a natural gas market. We are already in the road. Uh, we are already on our way. And uh, we expect to be uh, ready, perhaps by the end of next year, to liberate the natural gas prices in Mexico. We are we are we are building this market, uh, just like we are building the gasoline market, the uh, electrical market, and we're also building the natural gas market in Mexico. We believe that there could be a natural gas market. Um, uh, without an electricity market. What you cannot have is an electricity market without a good natural gas market. So uh, that's the, the road we're following. Thank you very much. If you can uh, please help me thank the secretary.